Welcome everybody to Psychedelics in the Global South. My name is Carmel Shachar and I'm the Executive Director of the Petrie Flom Center for Health Law Policy, Biotechnology and Bioethics at Harvard Law School. This is part of a three-part series called Psychedelics Around the World that we are hosting with the RAND Drug Policy Research Center. The first event, Psychedelics in the Global North, happened a few weeks ago, but if you want to check our website because you missed it, please feel free to click on. You should see the full event recording. It was a wonderful conversation, and I'm so excited to hear more from our panelists to understand the research that is being done across the globe in places like Mexico and Brazil and South Africa. Before we get to the event itself, a few housekeeping things. We will be saving time for a moderated question and answer session, so we very much encourage you to submit questions, which you can do at any time, even during the presentation, using the question and answer feature found in the meeting controls at the bottom of your screen. You're also welcome to join the conversation or submit questions on Twitter. We're at Petrie Flom. We will be sharing the fully captioned event video with all registrants, which include you within one to two weeks. Please feel free to share that link widely with friends, family, colleagues who you think might enjoy this conversation. If you have any technical issues, please email us at petri flom at law.harvard.edu and we'll do our best to help you. If you enjoyed this event and you're curious about the center, please sign up for our newsletter. It comes out only twice a month, so it will not clog your inbox. Please consider checking out our blog, Bill of Health, which gets about a million readers a year to read some really interesting scholarship on cutting edge health law questions, including around the regulation of psychedelics. Or check out our upcoming events. We'll have an event looking at psychedelics policy within indigenous communities in the coming weeks. As I mentioned, we're lucky enough to do this with the RAND Drug Policy Research Center, so please check out their website as well. The work they do is really thoughtful and innovative. With the housekeeping out of the way, I want to introduce you to our moderator, Mason Marks, who is not only an MD, he's also a JD. He's the Senior Fellow and Lead of the Project on Psychedelics Law and Regulation, or POPLAR, here at the Petrie Flom Center, as well as the Florida Bar Health Law Section Professor at Florida State University College of Law. Mason, handing it over to you. Thank you, Carmel. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Before we turn to our panelists, I want to thank a couple of people for making this event possible, specifically Laura Chong and Chloe Reichel of the Petrie Flom Center, and Bo Kilmer, of course, of the Rand Drug Policy Center. I also would like to thank Tim Ferris and Matt Mullenweg for supporting the work of Poplar through the SISE Foundation. We are in a time that many people refer to as the psychedelic renaissance which is a period defined by increasing interest in psychedelics research and commercialization. But with all the regulation and commercial activity in the United States and Canada, it can be easy to forget that psychedelics are truly a global phenomenon, and they always have been. They've been in use for a very long time in countries and communities around the world. And the purpose of this series, Psychedelics Around the World, is to draw attention to people researching or working with psychedelics internationally. And we have an outstanding lineup of speakers today from Mexico, Brazil, and South Africa to discuss their work in different areas of psychedelics research. Each presenter will speak for about 10 to 12 minutes, and then after they've all had a chance to present, we'll have a question and answer session so if you have questions, please do post them in the Zoom Q&A feature, and then when it comes time for the Q&A, I will pull questions from that uh, uh, repository. Okay, with that, I'm excited to turn things over to our speakers. And first up, we're going to hear from Laura Guzman Davalos, who is head of the Mycology Lab at the University of Guadalajara in Mexico. So welcome. 
and uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Mason, for inviting me. So do I start now with the yeah. presentation? Okay, <laughs> perfect. So let me share my screen. Okay, so many fa thanks for inviting me to participate in this event. I am going to talk about psilocybin, sacred and medicinal, but illegal experience from Mexico, the country where the hallucinogenic mushrooms of this genus, psilocybin, were discovered for science back in, in the 1950s, thanks to Gordon Watson's work. But above all, thanks to this indigenous Mazatec woman, Maria Sabina, who shared her wisdom to the world, the ma uh, to the world. The Mazatecs, uh, sorry, the Mazatecs have used this modern since they had memory. The Nino Santos, holy children, as they call them, have been an important part of their culture, mainly to heal or to solve many kinds of problems. Psilocybin was not only used by the Mazatecs, but by other Mexican indigenous groups like this Zapotec healer in the low, lower right corner and others as this small fig figure from the Capacha culture shows. Here is a, sorry. Here is a timeline of the history of psilocybin in Mexico. See, in pre-Hispanic times, these mushrooms have been used by various indigenous groups in Mexico. In the late 1950s, they were rediscovered for Western audiences. In the 60s, there was prolific research in psychiatry. Some research was even carried out in Mexico, such as that of Nieto, who experimented with the psyche effects of psilocybin cubensis. In the 70s, unfortunately, psychoactive drugs were banned due to many social reasons, including the hippie cultural revolution, the carelessness of some researchers, and the authorities' desires, desire to have more control over people. Fortunately, since the late uh, 90s, research for its use in medicine has been resumed and its legalization is being solved. You can talk about psilocybin without mentioning Guzman, but then the story will be incomplete. In 1957, the young Guzman began collecting psilocybin with Rolf Singer and for a pharmaceutical company. In 59, he submitted his undergraduate thesis on the taxonomy of these mushrooms and began to publish scientific papers on them. In the 60s and 70s, Guzman published nine papers on psilocybin and described 14 new species. It was in the 80s when he published the worldwide psilocybin monograph and in the 95, the supplement to this monograph. Then he published many articles until his death in January, 2016. Guzman has been the most prolific author in the description of psilocybin species worldwide. My team and I continue with, with, with Guzman's taxonomic work as well as with phylogenetic studies on psilocybin to search for evolutionary relationships among these species. The psilocybin genus includes approximately 150 species of mushrooms, which can produce psychoactive substance. About 20 of these species are present in Mexico. From the phylogenetic results presented, presented by Moncalvo and Matt teams, and following the nomenclature rules, the name psilocybin should not be used for psychedelic mushrooms because this name will have to be applied to other non hallucinogenic mushrooms. Thus, in 2007, we propose keeping the name psilocybin for the hallucinogenic species. The justification for doing this, rather than naming the genus as psychedelia, as Moncalvo proposed, was the great cultural importance of the term psilocybin and everything that derives from it, such as the hallucinogenic substance psilocybin. 
We continue the phylogenetic study of psilocybin. For example, the aim of this work is to analyze the position of the Mexican species in the phylogenetic tree of life of the genus using only ITS. One example is psilocybe as the column shown here, a little brown mushroom with a peculiar habitat among grasslands in pine forests in high mountains in Mexico. Psilocybe as the column was used by the Nahuatl of the Popocatépetl mountain, the second highest in Mexico. They call them little children or apipilsin in Nahuatl. Now we move on the next topic, the role of the hallucinogenic mushrooms in modern medicine. So far, it appears that psychedelics can be used for several illness or condition, including reduced depression, anxiety and stress, treatment of some psychiatric disorders, treatment of certain types of migraines, treatment in dependencies, among several other things. You can use them full dose, in a full dose, but recently the trend is microdosing psychedelics. That is a very small dose, which does not produce any perceptible effect. So we drive psilocybe where the normal dose is a, uh, the normal dose to have a treat is four or more grams. The person takes 0.1 to 0.5 grams as a microdose. Mexico has not escaped to this microdosis, microdosing trend. I contact with Loredana Tabano from Pionanacal Fungi and Cacao Company. She provided me with microdosis for a personal test and offered to contact her clients for a consumer study, which Mara Aro, my former PhD student, helped me analyze. We surveyed the clients of Teonanacal Fungian Cacao. So far, 120 responses have been received. The majority answered they start using microdoses due to an anxiety problem. Nevertheless, there was a relevant number of users who did it just for curiosity or in search of mental improvement. The principal component one only explained 25% of the variation in the results and was represented by change, referring to the number of physical and psychological change that the subjects presented when microdosing, as well as in terms of the number of positive effects they had. For its part, the principal component two only explained the 20% of the variation and was represented by having a medical prescription and chemical or biochemical tests that support the medical improvement. Its subjects were not divided between those with a previous medical diagnosis and those without, or between drug users and not users. We also asked about the positive sensations they felt when microdosing. The most mentioned is being an increase in concentration, followed by feelings of peace and happiness. However, several responded that they had no sensations. What about the legal, the legal status of the hallucinogenic mushrooms? Psilocybin and psilocin were included as Schedule I drugs in the United Nations Convention on Psychotropic Substance of 71. On this Schedule I are drugs with a high potential for abuse or drugs that have no recognized medical uses. What about Mexico? It all started in this country when Watson published Seeking the Magic Mushrooms in the popular magazine Life in 57. This turned the world upside down, especially the Mazatec world, making the existence of these mushrooms evident and changing the culture and perception around them by the public. Another route could have been followed. Instead, the mushrooms were prohibited mainly because the search and interest in them overflowed. In 69, foreign, mainly American and Mexican hippies were arrested and deported, the American, after a police and army raid in Huautla de Jiménez, Oaxaca. And as you can see in the magazine, in, in this magazine, in the cartoon on the cover, a Mexican is sweeping the hippies out of his border. 
So at that time, all medical, scientific, or cultural activities relate, related to the hallucinogenic mushrooms were prohibited. In the Mexican general law of hell, psilocybin and psilocin, and very importantly, also mushrooms that contain psilocybin, are included in chapter six or forbidden psychotropic substance. In the same law, it is mentioned that the planting, cultivation, harvesting, processing, preparation, conditioning, acquisition, possession, trade, transportation in any form, medical prescription, supply, employ, use, consumption, and in general, any act related to psychotropic substance or any product that contains them is prohibited. The law only says what is prohibited. Now it is up to the Mexican Federal Penal Code to say what the penalty is. For example, a prison sentence of 10 to 25 years and a fine of uh, 100 to 500 days will be imposed on those who produce, transport, traffic, trade, supply, even for free, prescribe any of the narcotics established in the general health law. There are some considerations, for example, the Mexican government will not act in special cases, such as with indigenous groups that use peyote, the cactus, or hallucinogenic mushrooms as part of their traditions. In 2016, I was appointed by the Office of the General Attorney of the Mexican Republic as an expert mycologist to identify the mushrooms confiscated to three subjects who acted suspiciously and ran away when the police approached them. The mushrooms in the back were in pretty bad shape, but still recognizable as psilocybicubensis. There have been movements in Mexico City trying to decriminalize the psilocybin, for example, in 2019. Unfortunately, the pandemic stopped all further efforts in this direction. Then, in March 2021, two political parties, Morena and Partido del Trabajo, proposed an initiative to reclassify entheogenic medicines that is hallucinogenic mushrooms, peyote, and other traditional plants in the general health law to eliminate the structural and legal barriers that prevent them from being used in research programs, medical and therapeutic uses, and in ceremonies and rituals. It is, they say, it is necessary to recognize that the use and knowledge of the Mexican pharmacopoeia has been kept alive for millennia thanks to the indigenous biopsycho-spiritual health systems that, in, that integrate the use of these plants, plants and fungi as fundamental part of their relationship with the world, with their territories, their cultures, their tradition, and their cosmovisions. Also, they say uh, that, uh, sorry, um, they say that the reversal of a historical error that has her over own roots. On the other hand, last year I participated virtually in a conversation on psilocybin and the general health law promoted by a senator from the Green Party. A Mazatec healer, a, phys a physiologist, a psychologist, a psychiatrist from the John Hopkins an investment specialist for mental illness treatment, a researcher from the Nierica Institute of Intercultural Medicine, the coordinator of the Ayahuasca Defense Fund, and myself as a biologist participate in this conversation. The difference between this proposal and the previous one is that this only focus, focus on psilocybin and the previous one also included peyote and other plants use it in traditional medicine. To end, my, to end my talk, I just want to emphasize the importance of psilocybin mushrooms as sacred, use it same time in memorial for religious and healing purpose by indigenous groups in Mexico. In addition to recalling their very important role and potential use in the treatment of psychological and psychiatric conditions, 
which was precisely discovered thanks to the teachings of the Mazatex. And finally, that we hope that the legal status before the Mexican government and other governments around the world change very soon and their benefits will outweigh fears. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was wonderful and very, uh, very timely. It sounds like this, this, um, the same conversation that you're describing is playing out in multiple places around the world. And uh, I have questions, but I think we'll, we'll save questions until uh, everyone has presented. Um, and next up, we have Rafael Guimaraes dos Santos from the Department of Neuroscience and Behavior at Hiberau Preto Medical School at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. So welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you all for the invitation. I will share my presentation. Can you all see them? Okay, Thanks, cool. thank you uh, once again for the invitation. I will talk about uh, ayahuasca research that we are doing here in Brazil in the next in the few two, maybe three decades of research. We have ayahuasca here and you can see in the first uh, image on the left is the, the vine, uh, Banseropsca api. Uh, the leaves of psychotropirides and ayahuasca being made here, uh, very near our, our university. Ayahuasca comes from the uh, Quichua, this uh, language uh, from the Andes, and it means ayah from spirit, and the vine for ayahuasca, or is it with the, the vine of the souls, is one of the, the most usually traditions, uh, translations. Uh, it's used until the present moment by dozens of uh, indigenous groups uh, spread not only in Brazil, but also in Colombia, Peru, and Ecuador. We see a photo here of uh, Kashinawa, indigenous uh, group in Brazil, and also a photo by Richard Ivan Schultz in the forest, in the 1940s, 50s, in the Cofan in, in Colombia. Uh, it's usually prepared by the prolonged decoction of these two plants, although this is a very specific to Brazil. Uh, if you go to indigenous groups, they can add other plants, and in Peru and parts of Colombia, they also can use other plants. But the legislation here in Brazil, we can only use Ibanesteropsis capi and Psychotervirides, which are each one rich in beta carbolines, harmine mailing in Ibanesteropsis capi and the hallucinogenic or psychedelic compound DMT in Psychotia Virides. And we can notice in the image here on the right that they have a chemical structure very similar to the neurotransmitter uh, serotonin, giving a, a hint of their mechanism of action, which is also similar to psilocybin in the case of DMT. Uh, but somehow we do not know how to explain, probably by try and an error, but the indigenous discovered that if you use only the psychotropic plants, nothing happens. And in reality, I think few people know that, but uh, the most like, I would say sacred plant, it's the divine, the, the, the liana, uh, the Vanistropsis capi used by several groups, and it's used as a base for trying other plants. So psychotropic is one of these other plants, the the, the name itself, ayahuasca, it's referring to the vine, to the liana. And we know now today that we have this uh, hepatic and peripheral enzyme, the monamine oxidase, that inhibits uh, the, the DMT degradation and it can reach uh, the brain. So the indigenous discovered that somehow, uh, we do not know when this discovery was made. Some researchers say it can have like, uh, 1,000 years, uh, 50, uh, 500 years, but the, the exact place and when uh, it's it's not known. So, uh, except for the indigenous use and also the uh, caboclo, ribeirinho, the, the mestizo use that are people that live near uh, indigenous groups, but are not uh, indigenous, living in the Amazon near the rivers and work 
uh, rubber places, they also got in contact with this uh, preparation. In the 30s, the first of the ayahuasca religions, Santo Daime was founded by Mestre Raimundo Nino Serra in Rio Branco, Acre State. In 1945, uh, Barquinha, the second religious group, was founded also in, in Acre by Frei Daniel de Matos. And the UDV, or Union do Vegetal, or Union of the Plants, was founded in the early 70s, uh, in, also in the Amazon, but in other, in, in Rondon, in other, in other states. And today, this, this number is actually not accurate, it probably is more. Uh, we have at least uh, 33, 23 countries, I think it's more, where ayahuasca has been used, but with several legal problems, I would say, in the next slides. And we can see here in the right, the Santo Daime and UDV uh, rituals, where people who use specific clothes, specific uh, organizations of the, the setting, uh, and have their own uh, and independent cosmologies. So this is the a part of the document by the United Nations from 71, where our Dr. Uh, Laura already said, but theoretically and also practically, I said theoretically because it depends on the country, all this kind of uh, entheogenic uses or ritual and uh, very cultural specific uses are not included in the prohibition. So uh, effectively, since 71 ayahuasca or, or psilocybin mushrooms or peyote should not be prohibited in, in nowhere because it's established there. But we know that's not how it, uh, it happens. Uh, it surprised me that even in Mexico, uh, this is also unfortunately the, the case. So this is the like, legislation of uh, Brazil Ayahuasca. M many people only know the 2010 resolution. It's uh, actually in Brazil today, uh, the ritual and religious use of Ayahuasca, it's uh, allowed it in all the country, uh, but some several steps uh, were needed to be reached before that. So. In 85, uh, probably by uh, the presence of DMT or because it was uh, used in the rituals, we don't, we're not sure uh, what happened, but some uh, people put the, the, the liana, Banisterops cap, in the list of prohibited plants. You can see the first uh, is Banisterops cap, Cipó de Chinchona or Chacrona Mariri. It's very interesting because Chacrona or Mariri are the names of the Psychotrophilides, not the vine. So, since the beginning, there was a confusion. Uh, but it's also with plants like uh, cannabis, uh, Erythroxon coca, Lophophora iliasa, peyote, that should not be in the list in the first place. But uh, in 86, uh, some people created a group to investigate the, the matter further. Uh, and 87 was made a uh, recommendation not to prohibit because there were families using it, communities, indigenous groups, and then uh, anonymous accusations, especially like uh, some people are using cannabis in the rituals and there are young people taking it and people with mental health problems. Another examination was, was made and a charter of principles among the religious groups was made, so the people don't use other drugs in the rituals, uh, having taken care of minors, people with mental health, then another report uh, prevailing, the, the 87 uh, report, and then another uh, wave of accusations. And again, the decision was uh, maintained. That's the, the decision that we have on the right image. It's the resolution from 2010 uh, today. So we can know what the resolution says. We can only use these two plants. Uh, it's only for religious and ritual use. Uh, we have to do sustainable use of this plant. So if you're going to take uh, one ton of Banisera cap, you have to seek for authorization and you have to plant, uh, including the, the bigger churches are stimulated to plant their own plants to, to do their own ayahuasca. Uh, no publicity to, that's the opposite already seen around the world with other psychedelics, uh, paid workshops. And we have a lot of reports in the media about the miraculous cures, which I think is a huge problem, the, the hype. And uh, the therapeutic use is only uh, authorized in a religious context. I mean, it's like you're going to the church seeking for help, not going to a, a physician or a psychiatrist. 
and uh, we have to do a minimum of interview before these people take uh, ayahuasca. If they're not taking other medications, they have may not have like neurological problems or cardiac problems. And we know, unfortunately, that many people do not do that. And it's a very polemic, but it's a decision from Brazil. Uh, minors can take ayahuasca because ayahuasca is understood in the Brazilian law on the freedom of religious. So their parents have the right to teach their religion to their children. So they can take very small amounts when they are young kids or teenagers, including the mothers can also take uh, by their own uh, decision. And uh, it's very atypical from the rest of the world too, that research must be promoted. So that's why we can promote research for ayahuasca uh, freely uh, in Brazil. But that's not the same around the globe. So just a, a small cut from the uh, ISIS Foundation, which I'm in the advisory board, and as also the Ayahuasca Defense Fund that tried to keep uh, some of these accusations uh, to free some of these uh, shamans and healers. So, but I, I cannot talk about all the countries, but Portugal, for instance, it's very close related to Brazil and has a very open uh, drug law. Uh, and it, even there, uh, the state is, 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 is gray. You know, it's not illegal, but Santo Daniel and David trying to uh, be recognized and they cannot. Like Spain, where, where I lived for uh, almost six years where I did my PhD, is also very complicated. And it's, the religions are not illegal, but they are also not recognized. And ayahuasca, uh, seizures are very high in Spain, like dozens of, of cases of people being uh, accused of international trafficking with uh, ayahuasca. And also we have the, uh, the case in the United States where uh, UDV got a Supreme Court authorization in New Mexico uh, in the early 2000s, if I remember well, and also in uh, Oregon, uh, ayahuasca church got authorization, but it's also very specific to states. What, what I want to say that I do not know any other country in the world that has the, the freedom that we have to do ayahuasca research. And part of this is showing what we do. This is our first, uh, in, in reality, this is the first trial in the world with hallucinogenic compounds in major depression. Although the psilocybin study by the group by David Nutt was published uh, uh, later and got much more attention. We are used to that, we are in the South, right? And, but we published first uh, of the psilocybin trial, showed that ayahuasca can have with a single dose, a fast and enduring antidepressant effect. And also we were the first one also to publish a double blind uh, parallel group placebo controlled trial replicating uh, these findings. Uh, in the next year, this is my uh, postdoc research. We also gave ayahuasca to people with social anxiety disorder and exposed them to a test which increases anxiety and they usually perceive themselves uh, worse during the performance but with ayahuasca you can see in the graphic that five hours after taking ayahuasca the this scale showing that people were improving the self-perception of the performance a very very interesting result uh, and this is very news nobody has this data yet uh, we are the first one to tie uh, the first ones to try uh, four consecutive weekly dose of ayahuasca compared with S-ketamine. So in this study, which you can see the results now, I cannot say which one take ayahuasca or ketamine because I know, but the study is still blind and I have students of mine watching my, my talk, so I cannot talk who is who, but you can, you can see promising results of decreasing depressive symptoms, increasing sleep quality, and very interesting, also decreasing the perception of pain. And here we can see something very interesting. As I said, there is both ayahuasca and ketamine here, and both of them are producing very similar psychoactive effects, at least in the intensity and in the, in the similar kind of psychological effects. So to the best of our knowledge, nobody is doing that. We are also doing the first trial of ayahuasca for uh, university students who abuse alcohol. Uh, I think it's a reality in several uh, countries of the world, I know that's a reality in the US, that university population drink more than the general population. So here you can see promising this is a single blind study, that's no, there's no placebo here, but we can see uh, the black line is the media, uh, which can see the uh, apparent reduction 
of days drinking and the quantity of alcohol units used. This study is now with seven volunteers and it's a very a pilot study. We maybe go to only 10, 12 volunteers. And also we, uh, we have some preclinical data, not from a lab, for example, from the lab of Dr. Olson uh, in California, uh, in Davis, uh, showing that the DMT, for example, it can uh, promote fear extinction in rodents, which is a, a good sign that could also maybe work for post-traumatic stress disorder. So we started this year the first uh, I think they are doing a study with PTSD with psilocybin also in the US, but this is the first with ayahuasca. We are also compare it with ketamine. And this is our first volunteer. I cannot tell you which is which is ketamine or ayahuasca, but we can see promising results, re reducing symptoms of PST uh, and reducing both anxiety and also depression symptoms. And uh, once again, increasing sleep quality. That's, I uh, would like to say uh, much more about what we are doing. We are, to do, we are also doing studies with Ibogaine here, and this is the, the team, Professor Jaime Alaki and Professor Flavio from here, Professor Jose Carlos and Janice that are from the ISIS uh, Foundation in Spain, and here are all our students. And something that's very pleasant for me to say, uh, it's that all the research we do, it's by the government. We do not have like uh, individuals paying for the studies or the industry, we all do with that government funding uh, resources. Thank you. Thank you, that's very interesting. That was wonderful. Our third speaker is Sana Malomil Nkadimeng, senior lecturer Life and in the Life and Com Consumer Sciences Department at the University of South Africa. Welcome and thanks for joining us. Thank you, Mason. I will just share my screen. All right, thank you. I believe it's visible. Okay, thank you. Yes, um, uh, my name is Sana. As I have been introduced, Dr. Sana Nkadimem from the University of South Africa. And I'm a senior lecturer in the human physiology and also the research project leader of psilocybin mushrooms and the psychedelic compound studies. My research area is actually in cardiovascular diseases in inflammation and also in the mental health studies of medicinal plants and mushrooms as alternative medicines. So currently I am, I just want to remove this. All right, so currently I am the research project leader of a research that investigates psilocybin mushrooms and psychedelic compounds for their medicinal use in the treatment of psychological diseases and conditions. And the reason I got into this as a physiologist was based on the results that I had physically, uh, basically just seen before, based on the depression that uh, depression generally is across the world. It is a burden and also responsible for about 800,000 people that are dying globally by suicide. And depression is associated with genetic factors and old age, chronic stress, and also chronic medical diseases. And people who are suffering from depressions are also more likely to also use other substances in order to cope with the pains. As a result, the substance use disorders are increasing and remain an enormous public health problem globally. So there is also recently uh, studies that have shown an increase in major depression in people that are suffering from chronic diseases such as cardiovascular diseases and also cancer. And actually with cardiovascular diseases, the studies showed that um, 
the people that are suffering from cardiovascular disease are two times more prone to develop major depression in comparison to the normal population. And with the cancer, it is uh, not uh, uh, that um, we are all aware that not uh, recently, like not long ago, the cancer patients were looking to look into laws that will allow them to take away their lives based on the pains and the depression and the all the sufferings that are connected to the or comes with the conditions of cancer. And inflammation is a central problem in many chronic diseases, in stress, and also in aging. And many studies had already shown the benefits of natural compounds and extracts from natural psychedelic uh, plants, such as the cannabis that comes from the cannabis plant. So the magic mushrooms is just another type of uh, the psychedelic uh, plants, uh, psychedelic um, compounds or psychedelic uh, mushrooms or plants or type of psychedelic stuff that actually uh, also have some psychedelic effect. And they are also commonly known as the magic mushrooms. And I do have a picture, okay. Uh, is my screen showing? All right. Uh, my screen has, okay, now it's back on. All right, thank you. The, this is the picture of one of the psilocybin naturalizes a species that I took from the previous work that I had done with the magic mushrooms. And the blue bruising is one of the prominent and known characteristics that identifies the mushrooms, uh, which is based on the, or due to the enzymatic reactions of psilocybin within uh, the mushrooms. However, as a scientist, we do, of course, uh, advise that people should definitely have uh, the mushrooms being identified properly by a mycologist. So psilocybin containing mushrooms have been used since ancient times for mental health and also to improve the quality of life by other indigenous people. However, in South Africa, I could not find any records of their use uh, 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 for any mental or for any medicinal use in South Africa. So psilocybin and magic mushrooms have antidepressant effects that uh, the previous speaker already have spoken about which are facilitated via the signals that are implicated in emotional processes in neuroendocrine system and also in the behavioral flexibility. So there are also a few pilot studies that have shown their potential anti-addiction specifically with the alcohol and also with the, the tobacco. Moderate to low concentrations were also found to be safe wherever However, the high concentrations were found to evoke some strong psychedelic experiments, experiences. So psilocybin, one of the things that make them even more interesting is the fact that they also have very low risk of dependency. However, with all of these uh, wonderful things that are known already with the psilocybin, they still are remaining the scheduled substances in many countries and also in South Africa, both psilocybin and psilocybin mushrooms are also scheduled substances. And according to the South African law, uh, the psilocybin and I, other psychotropic substances are regulated by the South African law or the Drugs and Drugs Traffic Trafficking Act number 140 of 1992, which is called the Drug Act. And under this act, section four and five of the act basically addresses and criminalizes or prohibit the use of this uh, product or this psychedelic uh, compounds or drugs, and also even their dealings as well. However, in South Africa, there are also certain exceptions which include the bona fide research, um, research with the exceptions that comes in terms of um, the medicinal control. So the Medicine Control Act 101 of 1965 
Under that uh, act, section 25 of that act basically provides a way for the best, uh, experimental use of the medicines. However, they are subject to very uh, strict regulatory requirements. So the South African Health and Product Authority, which is usually referred to as SAPRA in South Africa, assumes the roles of this uh, Medical Control Council and also of the DRC. So SAPRA is an entity of the National Department of Health that is created by the South African government. And it is also the entity that is responsible for the regulation of health products intended for both human and animal use, the licensing of the manufacturers, wholesalers, distributors of medicines, medical devices, radiation emitted devices and radio active neutralize and also very important this is the entity also that conduct or uh, that is responsible for the conduction of clinical trials in a manner that, that is compatible with the national medicines policy so it is the entity that enforces the medicines policy as well so in terms of the medicines control of the law south african law psilocybin currently is listed as a schedule seven substances as such this means that it is deemed to have no legitimate medicinal use and also remain prohibited in south africa and due to all these legal constraints very little information and research has actually been done even in south africa and the research on their safety physiological and psychological effects is very limited even globally as well. So in my previous work on the psychedelic mushrooms, I actually demonstrated and supported the safe use of these psychedelic uh, mushrooms. And my publications are actually the first on this topic in South Africa. In my first, uh, I'll just share through of my work. In the first work, uh, we look at the effects and safety of psilocybin, cubensis, and paniola sciences magic mushrooms extracts, which were tested on the endothelin induced hypertrophy and also on the cell injury. So, the study concluded from this research that the mushrooms, these two mushrooms that were used, actually did not aggravate the pathological hypertrophy induced by endothelin 1. And they also reduce the endothelin one induced in uh, intracellular ROS level or oxidative level. And they protected against the TNF alpha induced injury and cell death. And they were also safe uh, with the concentrations that we used in the study, indicating that all the results that we received were not necessarily coming from the toxicity or cytotoxicity of the mushrooms. And this study basically was showing because previously and with all the studies that have been done with psilocybin, mainly they were focusing on their psychological effects. And here we wanted to look if in the mushrooms with all the other compounds that are there, will there be other mushrooms uh, compounds that will induce or aggravate uh, the, the situation if someone is taking them while they are experiencing or under an endothelin pathological hypertrophy or medication or condition. So in the second study, we look at the phytochemical, the cytotoxicity and the antioxidant and anti-inflammatory for the first time of psyche, uh, a mushroom called psilocybin natalensis, magic mushrooms. And in this study, we concluded or find that the mushroom actually has antioxidant effect and for the first time this work actually um, showed their anti-inflammatory effect because that was also one of the things that had all never been looked at and the phytochemical analysis that we did in this study also confirmed the presence of natural antioxidant and anti-inflammatory compounds that were present in both the ethanol and the water extracts that were used and then the study also showed that these mushrooms were generally safe at the concentrations that we used in the study. So the, these effects were not coming from uh, cytotoxic, cytotoxicity induction. And also it was showing that these res results actually came from the, the, the mushrooms themselves, showing the antioxidant and also showing those anti-inflammatory effects. 
And in the other last stu study that I will share, which was published in the Journal of Inflammation Research uh, with the title Anti-Inflammatory Effects of Four Psilocybin Containing Magic Mushrooms, Water Extract in Vitro, on the 15 lipoxygenase activity and also on the lipopolysaccharide induced cyclooxygenase 2 and inflammatory cytokine for the first time in the human microphage cells. And in this study, we also found that the mushrooms that were used, so all the four mushrooms water extracted, actually showed to execute it by downregulating the pro-inflammatory mediators. And the study also found here that those mushrooms extracts that were used were safe. And all this uh, publication basically uh, started the, even the revolution of looking at the anti-inflammatory effects of the mushrooms because before elsewhere globally they were just being perceived based on their psychological effects. So this was the first time where it, they were actually uh, we actually looked at their other medical or medicinal benefits and we found that they do have anti-inflammatory effects and it was a wonderful discovery to find which means that over and above whatever that they do uh, psychologically they also have other if, uh, benefits that you can actually get from this mushroom so in my current project uh, i'm actually aiming at investigating the safety feather because also most of the studies that were done have been done on the healthy individual. So I am also looking into how or where, how the psilocybin compound or the psilocybin mushrooms will react with uh, the medication or if they are used with the people that are also suffering or that are suffering from depression and addiction that is coming also from other things or they are also having any additional uh, problems like maybe the cardiovascular, problems or conditions. So the first uh, current aim is to investigate their safety, the physiological, the neurological activity and psychological effect of these psychedelic compounds, psilocybin and psilocybin mushroom extract in health and also in clinical conditions that are associated with depression and also with drug addiction. And the second aim is also to look or to investigate their medicinal use in order to support their development as potential drug therapeutic agents in South Africa. And my third uh, aim also is to establish a psych psychedelic study research center or a group in South Africa, which will be like a safe space where all these effects can be uh, uh, investigated with in an area or environment that will allow the compliance as it stands or as it is required with this kind of, of research. So my approach to this, looking into the, both the psilocybin and the psilocybin uh, studies is divided into two. I have some studies that I'm going to look into the preclinical basic studies, which involves a group of of, of students and we'll be looking at the safety, the physiological and also the neuro neurological activity of the, both the psilocybin and the psilocybin mushrooms. And currently we have, I have about three masters and three PhDs who are already undertaking the research, looking at all these preclinical basics effects that comes both from the psilocybin and psilocybin mushrooms. They are also postdocs also within that group. And the second part also that I'm looking into is the clinical trial studies. And this is going to be approached basically just looking at the psilocybin compound. And under this, I have two clinicals that are underway. The first one is on the anti-addiction and the other is on the antidepressant. And looking at this, uh, we are looking at how uh, well, the, the psilocybin compound itself assists even here in South Africa. So currently, this research are going or subjected to internal South African ethics clearances within institutions and also to be going into the SAPRA clearance and permit licenses. So I cannot necessarily uh, share more about it, but I believe in the near future, especially with the clinical trial studies, I will be having something uh, to share. And this study is funded um, 
externally uh, by a company that funded me with my previous work that I have done on the psychedelic uh, studies. And it's funded for 5 million South African rand over the coming five years with a total of 25 million South African rand. So in my closing remarks, as far as the psilocybin and the psilocybin magic mushrooms are concerned, the studies are showing a significant effectiveness and potential of these mushrooms and especially this uh, psilocybin compound in the treatment of the chronic physiological conditions and also in the conditions that affect most of the most vulnerable community which is the mental community that suffers from mental health illnesses and the low risk of dependency that have been already established with psilocybin makes them even highly desirable and as a result this uh, psychedelic comp uh, compound and mushrooms basically carry hope and potential not only that will be or beneficial to the person that will undergo the treatment but also to ease the family dysfunctions and also the socio-economic factors that are associated with mental health illness conditions such as the addictions and also the substance use disorders and these are the things also that have brought my attention and my group's attention into working with these uh, mushrooms and also with the compound psilocybin. So currently the studies are definitely showing that there is undeniable medi medicinal benefit that comes from psilocybin and based on this efficacy and also on the safety of psilocybin in South Africa, it appears that the classifications of psilocybin, which is currently uh, classified as, as Schedule 7, is definitely unsustainable in our country. And for its use for medicinal purposes, this mushroom or this compound will, have, will require to be classified under Schedule 6. And in the absence of a change to the present legal classifications of psilocybin, the alternative then will be to approach the constitutional uh, and challenge that on a similar basis to that of cannabis. And my research or the project that I'm undergoing is also looking into this, because if you remember the second aim of this research is to advertise or to go towards their use for medicinal purposes. And this will be approached or uh, we are going to approach this with the help or the assistance of advocate Al Molland, who is the advocate that I'm currently working with here in South Africa, and also with the other colle uh, colleagues in the legal uh, in the legal uh, sections as well. So basically, this is why uh, we and what I am doing, and these are the references that I used in my presentations. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was an amazing overview of your research. I really enjoyed that. And um, I, I, just a reminder, if you have any questions for our speakers, uh, please put them into the Q&A feature. But I, I have a couple questions for you to start off. Um, the first one is you mentioned some of the funding of your research. And um, we also heard about how uh, research on ayahuasca was being funded by the um, uh, the government in the, in the United States, we don't have, um, we're just starting to get some, some uh, federal funding of psychedelics research. Is there anything like that in South Africa? Is there any federal and, uh, or national investment in, in the research? Yes, there are national research funding that you can get, but not necessarily specific for the psychedelics. But when I was doing my previous, uh, in my previous uh, research, I did receive some uh, funding from the WHCTA that was government-based, but I, I was also funded by this company as well. So there aren't so any funding legal is there, but it's not necessarily directed to the psychedelic. It's actually new. I'm the first person in South Africa to legally uh, actually study this and legally publish with all the license, going through all the licensing and all the approvals that are needed. So it's still quite new. I go to some places and I present and people wondering what are magic mushrooms, what am I talking about? So yes. <laughs> I also wanted to ask you, 
the, the research that you've done and that you're doing on the anti-inflammatory effects is really intriguing. And there are some concerns that have been advanced largely by, I, I hear them a lot from pharmacists uh, or pharmacologists, mm -hmm. uh, concern about microdosing psilocybin and the potential for hypertrophy of the uh, valve leaflets of the heart. And, mm. But as far as I understand, this is, it's never been uh, demonstrated experimentally or um, uh, it's never been observed clinically. It's a, a theoretical concern. I was, I was wondering to hear your, your thoughts on that, you know, given your, your experimental findings, if you, yes. if, if you think they're real. Yes, I, I think I, I do get because if they, especially if they can affect the HT2B receptor, there could be something that could come out of that. That is why in my study, you, you would see that it started with the safety because I'm also looking into when you use them within a certain condition, let's say you are having depression that is emanating from a cardiovascular disease, where, but which involves hypertrophy. If you are using the mushrooms, will they exacerbate that? So that is one of the things actually that I am looking at because as a scientist also, I'm not looking to bring out a compound that will be dangerous to people. I'm looking to bring out the, the compounds or I mean, the, not the compounds, but the products that will have that would have been tested in all spheres. And it's not necessarily to say if when you have hypertension that or you have a certain disease, then you can't take them, then we will ban them. No, it is in the same way as, you know, with a, a Panado, the normal Panado, I don't know what you call it in the US, a paracetamol, you know that in the labs, when we induce toxicity of the liver, I actually use that uh, Panado that we use, but then it does not mean that we'll take it off the shelf. So what it means is that when you are experiencing or are suffering from liver conditions, you shouldn't be drinking Panado if you are experiencing any pain. So it is the same thing actually that I'm also looking into. I'm looking, that is why I'm having even a field of students that are looking into certain, they're looking all into each individually, another area and looking at them, how safe will they be under those conditions? So that at the end of the day, when we take out a product, we can say to you, no, if you are suffering from depression that is emanating from an ET1 uh, uh, hypertrophy aggravation, then maybe you shouldn't be taking this. Or if you are taking it, uh, suffering from depression from this side, you should be taking it, but at this concentration. So those are the fundamental, wonderful things, actually, as a scientist that I am looking into, because we are not just saying uh, use psilocybin, even you know, with all uh, whatever, but we want to say use it, and it is safe when it is used this way. It is not safe, or it will aggravate, or it will not aggravate, or it will cross even with the medication. You know, because many, most of the people that are using it will basically be suffering from cancer. So we also need to check how or when or if it will cross with that as well. And those are the things that uh, the research center that I want looking to have started building already will be looking into. Thank you. Very interesting and obviously very important as well. Yay. We do have a question uh, from the audience for um, Professor Davalos. Uh, asking, praising you for your presentation and asking you a bit about um, the, the mechanism of action of psilocybin. And, and a couple of you talked a little bit about this already, um, the action on the serotonergic system and the potential increase in behavioral flexibility, for example. Uh, but yes. I wonder if you could comment any further on that. And then um, another sort of twist on that um, also for uh, Professor Davalos, the, from an anonymous attendee, have you noticed any particular traits or variables that are correlated with positive or negative experiences when people use uh, psilocybin? Yes, with the research that I have done, which is why in my presentation, I mentioned that I've read from the research that were done with people using different concentrations. With the moderate to low concentrations, 
they seem to be very safe, but the people that have used higher concentrations, they have actually evoked very uh, unwanted uh, results. And that is why also even when you do clinicals, we usually will check at the background of the, the patients or the subjects to be used. It's very important if they have a psychotic uh, background that you exclude or you look at that very attentively. And those are the things also that falls under the safety as well. And it's one of the things also, even as a scientist, as I'm working on this, I'm also looking at them that they should be used under a controlled environment, whereby the patient, after they have been given this uh, medication that has psilocybin or that is psilocybin, they need to be monitored uh, thoroughly and it's at least within a day before they can be sent out. And there has to be a, a, a follow up on the individuals because it's possible to have those psychoactive uh, experiences with very high um, dosage, uh, studies have shown. Thank you. Professor Davalos, would you like to chime in? Uh, yes, yes, of course. Uh, I was confused because I am Guzman Davalos. <laughs> Guzman is the first uh, last name. And I'm not used to, they call me Davalos. Yes, uh, one of the problems with the microdosing and with the use of these mushrooms is that you are using the whole mushrooms, the dry mushrooms, and you don't know what exactly is in the, that mushrooms. That's you don't, you don't you don't know how many or how, which one of the substances are present because it's not only psilocybin because they also have beocysteine, nor beocysteine, and other alkaloids that can produce some symptoms. So when you use the dry mushrooms, we don't know which of them are present and in which quantity they are present. So that's the problem when you use uh, the uh, when microdosing is only dry mushrooms, or when you use a complete doses, is not a, not known what is the dose you use. I don't know if uh, Professor Sana, they, if they use the complete mushrooms or they extract the psilocybin and then use the psilocybin. So this is could be a results that are replic replicable. Thank you for correcting me. I will get your name correct next time. I, I also <laughs> so, wanted to. <laughs> I also wanted to ask you. Um, you mentioned microdosing and the the legal status of um, mushrooms in Mexico is a little ambiguous, unclear. Do you think that people who are microdosing now in Mexico, what, what kind of legal risks might they be exposing themselves to? Or is it, is it probably not enforced? How, how would you characterize the, the legal climate and the risk that people microdosing or using regular doses might, might face? Yes, if, if they are out of law, they are, but the law in this case are not enforced. But um, I'm not sure. It's relatively new the use of microdosis. There are many people selling. I think that I am worried about the sellers, maybe not the consumers, because the consumers but there are many, and the dose, doses are very uh, low. So I think that they do, do not have problem because it's not in form of the law. But uh, the sellers. They are out of the law, so I I don't know which can happen. Thank you. But, I wanted to ask you, Dr. Dos Santos. Um, you well, I wondered if I wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about the federal funding and how how that came about. Um, and I also wanted to ask you um, about how it seemed like in your presentation the legal reforms that you discussed seem to really emphasize the traditional uses, the ceremonial uses, whereas in the United States and elsewhere, like in um, Australia, for example, we're seeing um, the medical uses at the forefront of the legal reforms. So I just wanted to see if you might have any thoughts on, on those uh, differences. Uh, thank you. 
uh, regarding your first question, uh, ayahuasca research was always performed in Brazil as any other kind of research. So uh, the, the first studies in Brazil were made in the early 90s. Uh, this was this OASCA project in the UDV that was also with collaboration with uh, University of the US. For example, Dr. Dennis McKenna participated. Uh, University of uh, Finland and uh, Charles Grob in, in California also participated in, in the early uh, 90s. So that had some uh, money from, from abroad, I think. But most of the research is like any other compound, any other drug, any other post-graduation program here. So we have a educational method that we have like a graduation and then we have masters, like a two years a masters, and then you have the PhD a four-year, five-year PhD. And all our projects here, for example, are done inside this scheme. He comes a student in the early investigation career, and then he grows up in the lab, but always doing research with the scholarships from the most, I mean, 100% of the scholarships are from the government. So this all uh, happened and keeps happening, but it all happened before the this hype in the economic or in medical this uh, it's it's a very interesting question for me because uh, uh maybe some people not all people say that the psychedelic renaissance i really don't like these sketchy names this but uh it started in 2006 with the paper by john hopkins in by griffiths uh so that's not true the psychedelic renaissance started in the early 90s with Dr. Rick Strassman in the US with DMT, with Dr. Margie Fahey in Spain with MDMA, with Dr. Gozulis Mai Frank in Germany with DMT ketamine, uh, with Dr. Volden, Franz Wollenweider in Switzerland with psilocybin, and here in Brazil with ayahuasca in the early 90s. So uh, it's kind of sad, and I'm happy to be able to talk that, that the history of our research is not always told. Uh, we have to face the, the truth that many of the research are much more talked in the if they are done in the US or Europe than in Mexico, Brazil, or South Africa. Inclusive congratulations, Dr. Sana and Laura for being doing this. So, uh, so I am a researcher by, uh, I was uh, raised as a researcher. So. When I went to do my PhD in Spain in 2006 with Dr. George Riba, unfortunately he's uh, is not with us anymore, we are researchers like, what's that? What these drugs do? Are they safe? Uh, and then when came the paper by, by Griffiths, all, to, all that's medicine, but wait up, we, we, are, we already know that since the 50s. This is not news. And our people are doing patents in things that are not new, I mean. You know, DMT was discovered in the 50s, in, the, in their 30s was synthesizing, and LSD and, and mescal. And so what's happening? Uh, how this changed so fast in so few years? So I, I, I remember talking with Dr. Jordi Riba or, or watching talks by Dr. Volen Vardis saying, these are psychotic models. These are not therapeutic. This increase anxiety. How can this be therapeutic? And then... Uh, the field just changed very, very, very fast. And I, I think in some times for the worse, uh, because now we have this hype. Everybody's saying that this is like miracle drugs. You can see documentaries in the Netflix with all these scholars saying that people have this wonderful, colorful experience. And we do the research and we know that it's not true in several cases. So... We keep with the research. Uh, if we can show scientifically that these substances do have medicinal uh, properties, I do think that they should be allowed and more investigated. But I think when the industry uh, put the, the hand on this, got very, very strange, at least uh, in, in my point of view. So every month there's a new patent saying like the patent LSD for anxiety, uh, mescaline, uh, and now I just received one patent of oral variations of DMT. But this this is a real patent because you are changing and producing something that's not in the nature. But I mean, psilocybin, uh, Maria Sabina was there much before Gordon Watson and 
And several uh, researchers in the field are starting to ask, okay, you sell psilocybin, but what about the indigenous rights? What about the, the, the commitments that we have to these communities that they discovered uh, first? So in Brazil here, for example, all the legislation that I showed to you was performed, as I said, for religious and ritual use because these communities were already there using that since we do not know uh, when. And they all always use it therapeutically in, therapeutically in that context, I mean, spiritually therapeutically, not medicinal, pharmacy therapeutically. So uh, the ayahuasca that we use in the trials is produced by these communities. We do not produce the ayahuasca here. We do not use the synthetic compounds. Of course, if someone industry comes, yeah, we wanna do a trial of synthetic DMT. Okay, that's different. That's not ayahuasca, that's an, another thing. And for example, we have to fill documents here in Brazil saying that you're accessing this traditional knowledge. There is a very specific legislation in Brazil to access traditional knowledge and you have obligations with these traditional groups if you develop that commercially. Uh, for instance. So that's why we keep here very humbly <laughs> doing research, scientific research. We are not really seeking uh, to patent uh, these compounds. I, I really do not know exactly what will happen if I ask if it's be a therapeutic plant because Brazil has a specific legislation for medicinal plants. Ayahuasca is still not there. Uh, how it's going to be used who is going to administer it? So we, we do not know that. Uh, but yes, all that we do here is respecting the traditional groups and with government uh, resources. Thank you. I have a, a few more questions for Dr. Nkadimeng. Uh, one of them is, um, how have you found the dose to relate to safety? Are, are there particular dosages of psilocybin that have been found to be more safe? Um, and then are there any other interesting compounds that you've isolated from the, from the mushrooms in addition to psilocybin and psilocin? Uh, thank you, Mason. Um, Currently, I am actually in it's isolating some of the compounds is one of the things that would come out recently in this current study, because I will be synthesizing it and also isolating from the mushrooms. So I have not done that yet. It was difficult because I could not find the standard. So when you isolate also, you want, you need to have a standard, which is why I need to first um, uh, synthesize it based on the structure and then I can use that to standardize to say, okay, what I have isolated is actually there. But that is in the current uh, studies currently. And then the other question was... Oh, how, does, how, do, how have you found that dose relates to safety? So someone asked specifically, are there specific doses that have been demonstrated to be more safe than others, but I guess just generally, have you found any relationship there? Yes, yes, they are there uh, because there are people that have used, for instance, uh, 30 milligrams. There are those that have used more than that. There are people that have used 20 milligrams of psilocybin uh, to either, most of them were actually towards the anxiety and the depression. And then there are studies that have actually used as small as 0.2 milligram per, per 70 kg and they still received um, the proper uh, response from the patients that were being uh, and, uh, taken under the, the research. So they, they are there already. It's not something that one will have to establish from scratch. There are already some pilots that have used certain doses which the, pe the people that were taking it under the trial reported not to have any psychotic um, responses, but then they had the positive mood and, and stop uh, drinking or stop or felt the need not to smoke anymore. And then the tobacco use was reduced. So when you look at the dose, it's not necessary to start from scratch. So one would have to look at what already has been there and to look at what was found then 
you also use your own and then you establish the safe one within where you are. And if you are using the Monda cells, there are also calculations that you can do. Like for instance, where, uh, the, with the anti-inflammatory, I use the 25 microgram per ml on the cells, on the cellular level. And there is a way for me, if I want to uh, experiment with that, because I know that small amount can already induce very anti-inflammatory effects. I know how to calculate to uh, convert it into the dose, into the humans or into the animals in vivo. That is very easy. It's a calculation, it's a matter of calculations, which I am able to do. One more question for you from Peyton Lamb. What are your thoughts on the potential use? You mentioned um, uh, the potential anti-addictive effects of psilocybin. What are your thoughts on the potential use for to treat opioid addiction or opiate addiction uh, and potentially in an acute setting? So is there any potential to help people detox, for example, from uh, opioids? I, I believe so. It is one of the things that I'm proposing here in South Africa. I, like I did say in my uh, presentations, I do have a clinical trial that I have already submitted a um, proposal for, which I will be undertaking that is false under anti-addiction. And there I'm actually going to look at its effect on uh, the SU2, the substance use disorders, because it has been done with alcohol and with uh, uh, tobacco. But I'm actually going to look at one of the South African street drugs. And uh, the purpose is to induce it into those people and see how they will react because it, it has a way of changing the perception of, of, of individuals, which is why then they start feeling, why should I, I continue like drinking? Why should I continue? So it helps a lot. And also it sort of gives the patient a, 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 a different perspective, which is one of the interesting things that uh, this uh, psychedelic compound psilocybin actually does. So I am definitely proposing because I'm having in South Africa currently a, a clinical trial that is based on the anti-addiction and I'm actually targeting one of the strict uh, drugs that is said to be very, very addictive and people are struggling to get out of it. Even those that are out of it, it's sort of, they take forever to, it takes forever to take, get out of their system or detox and all of those things. So it's something that I, I, I will propose that it is possible, but we need to look into, although it is difficult with relation to the legal constraints, but it's something to really look into. And I believe that there will be uh, there, there will be positive results that will come out of it. And if you look at the pilots that were done, they are basically just three in numbers. <laughs> so you see that uh, there is a lot that needs to be uncovered. And it holds the hope which we shouldn't really look uh, aside, especially when it comes to mental health issues, because there are things that just not only affect the individual, they are dysfunctioning the families, they are dysfunctioning our communities, we are having so many things that are happening and most of them are derived from the, the substance abuse and the mental health illness as well. So it's really something that I believe should be looked into. So I do think that it's a proposal. I can, I will hypothesize that it's possible. Dr. Guzman Davalos, do you have any thoughts on use of psilocybin for opioid addiction, substance use conditions in general? Yes, I think that it is very possible. That is one of the benefits of uh, psilocybe that is you know, causing addiction, but not only that, but it can be used to, to cure and to treat addictions. I Last year I was in the US in a, attending a Teluridae Mushroom Festival. And there I saw a presentation of one of the researchers from the US. I don't remember at this moment uh, her, his name. And he was making uh, clinical trials to treat uh, addictions of uh, co coke. Uh, how do you say coca? Co coca? <laughs> 
Yeah. Cocaine. Coca. Okay. Cocaine. Okay. Yes. To to cocaine. So I think that it is very promising to to use psilocybin in that way. Uh, the other problem is uh, in Mexico. Um, I imagine that in all the world, the mushrooms are now in fashion. It is a trend that uh, everybody wants to consume and to try. And if this is not made in a controlled environment, it uh, it can cause a, pro a very big problem. For example, here in Mexico, uh, the trend is to consume chocongos, so chocolates with mushrooms. And this uh, chocolate with mushrooms, chocongos, can causes a fatality just three months ago because uh, a young person tried them and he was alone and then he thought that he can he could fly and he drove from the building so he he died so it, it's a problem when the users try to these mushrooms without a uh, advice um, as a, only as a recreative uh, process or only as a recreative uh, experience so it can be it need to be to be take care of this more more carefully we are running short on time so start to wrap up now i just want to ask all of you if you have any closing thoughts for what you might like to see in, in your country, in your region, at your university, what are your hopes for the future when it comes to psychedelic research or policy? Well, I, I would like to see that, that my government approves and put the psilocybin and the mushroom producing psilocybin in uh, another uh, chapter so that the, all the medical uh, investigation is allowed because uh, I congratulate that uh, Dr. Sana is making so interesting work on that, but here in Mexico is not possible yet, it's very, very difficult. So I'm working in another area in taxonomic phylogenetic and uh, Another that I didn't talk about that is ethnomycology, and one of my postdoc students is making a current study in Oaxaca to see what happened after so many years since Wasson and what is happening now. It seems that Mazatecs are still using the, the mushrooms, but in a very different way. They are making business with the mushrooms and they are managing the mushrooms the, without the intervention of any foreign guests, but in a very different way as a business. So it is very important to study that and to see how is uh, the knowledge of these mushrooms are changing. So interesting. Other thoughts? <laughs> All right, uh, from my side, thank you very much for the platform. I would love to see from South Africa if the constraints can be, uh, you know, lessen a little bit because it's making it very difficult. But however, I am grateful because within all the constraints that they do have, uh, the law still allow us to, to do research in, even though it is very, it is done under very, very uh, serious legal um, and constraints as well. And uh, what I would like to see, because of, with what I have seen and what I have also studied with the psilocybin and the mushrooms, they really do have a serious hope for serious illnesses. And I would really like, um, to see them and to, to see us being able to can actually investigate and hopefully to come to a point where uh, we'll, we'll be able to can say you can use them this way and this way. But I would definitely say that whichever way that they will be used, it will have to be under controlled environment. As a scientist, I will definitely support that they are done under controlled environments. 
that they are done with the proper medical care because if they are used correctly, they will definitely bring out the best. There are things, I, I was just imagining if they can, you know, solve one of the SUD that we have here in South Africa, it will be like a revolution. It will be so wonderful because the kids here are suffering from this one particular SUD uh, uh, substance abuse that they use. And then once they are hooked, it is sort of in, in, in impossible for most of them to get out. And you are watching a young person at the age of 20, at age of 18, already it's like their life is over. So if we can have a center where we will be able to take these young people, bring them into that and then treat them accordingly. And then they come out of that center new people, then they can still go back into the community and contribute accordingly. They can contribute to their families and to the community and to their country. So I honestly believe that it holds a very good hope, but it will have to be handled uh, with control, uh, under very controlled and under a, a, a serious care. And it's possible. And that is just one of the things that I wish uh, to achieve here in, in South Africa. Thank you very much. Dr. Dos Santos, give you the final word. Thank you for the invitation, a pleasure to be here. And I wish to see more, more ethics in the research, ethics by the scientists in declaring their conflicts of interest, uh, ethics in today, uh, a man was arrested because he was selling several products with, based on mushrooms because the mushrooms are not in the Brazilian legislation. Psilocybin is, but not the mushrooms. So people are abusing that. And I really want to see more high level uh, clinical research. Since this, these years, uh, we noted several uh, scientific journals that are used to be very strict, publishing uh, low level scientific research. And so this hype, I think this hype should be, should be contained. We have very, very few very few I can put in my two hands the clinical trials really done with uh, double blind uh, groups and placebo and people are already using these drugs as they have been approved for many years ago so uh, more ethics more care and you know and also to respect the indigenous traditional knowledge too well thank you so much to all of our panelists and all in attendance this has been a real pleasure I'm really grateful for your time and I hope that we've sparked some future conversations and that uh, we'll all stay in touch and uh, look forward to engaging with you in the future. So thank you so much and have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much.